the the story that I know is that you and some college buddies, you know, and from our last conversation got together and we're like, Hey, let's, you know, combine our love of the coastline, fishing, surfing, and then put some money in a hat. And what was it like 200 bucks, something like that. Yep. Um, well, it was actually high school buddies, uh, not high college. school buddies. <laughs> yeah. So it was, uh, yeah. We all went to college, different places and, uh, um, you know, all graduated, came back home mm-hmm. and uh we're working nine to fives and and then getting together on the weekends and drinking beers and um there was like this dive bar one of our our partners our current ceo he mm-hmm. lived across the street from this little dive pub that we loved going to and you know we were broke and and we would go to his apartment <laughs> and drink like a 30 pack you know um around his coffee table before mm-hmm. we'd go across the street to get cheap beers but even like cheap beers were too expensive for us at that sure. point. Um, and uh, yeah, we just talked about it. One weekend, we, we took a trip up to Vermont to go snowboarding at uh, Mount Snow. And we, you know, talked about, you know, the whole um, car ride up, talked about starting a business together, you know, what industry, what, what, um, what mm-hmm. type of company, um, lift lines in the lodge at the house. We just, the whole weekend we just talked about it and then came home you know we'd get together at his place on weekend drink of beers and um yeah eventually i, I went and backpacked like australia did you really for, yeah for a few months like before i left we were like okay like we we had kind of a working name with jetty mm-hmm. and we had the the working logo and we kind of had all like you know loosely agreed on it and we're like all right i'm gonna go backpack for three months in australia we're, let's eat, let's keep in touch over email. I mean, this was 2003. So like mm-hmm. everyone had like an AOL or an excite account, you know, <laughs> and a MySpace. Uh, yeah. And we just kept in touch over email while, while I was away and shooting ideas around. And, um, as soon as I got home, it was like April or May when I got home. And, uh, that was kind of like the shitter get off the pot. It was like, all right, mm-hmm. like, are we doing this? Or are we not? And yeah, we each put 200 bucks and literally in a trucker hat in the middle of the coffee table. <laughs> um, and yeah, a thousand bucks, and we made three T-shirt designs and sold them mm-hmm. to um, two local surf shops um, around here. So you guys go from, you know, creating this this idea, do you, do you, and and then putting your money in a hat, going on going backpack in Australia, which sounds like an awesome trip, by the way. I mean, having done a lot of backpacking in the United States, why Australia? Why'd you pick that? Because uh, I was. Um, that fall, mm-hmm. that was like, I think February when I went to Australia. So like that October before that, um, I went with, with that, the Faria surfing sh- uh, sport guy, mm-hmm. Brian, um, so me, him, and a couple other people went to Portugal to go surf. Oh, awesome. And, um, we met an Australian guy and, uh, like, like he, we just all kind of got along and we all started hanging out and surfing mm-hmm. and hanging out together in Portugal. And um, we stayed in touch, and he offered um, his family ran a winery in um, in Melbourne, outside of Melbourne, hmm. and was like just all, he's like, hey, my my parents run this winery. We have an you know spare room and come on out car. <laughs> if you want to come out. Um, you know, you got a place to stay, and we'll put you up. And so I was like, well, don't offer it if you don't mean it. And he talked to his parents and, and lined it all up. So. Um, so yeah, I went and, and, you know, worked at this winery and, and, uh, just w- wash dishes, bus tables, like whatever I could do to help the family out right. while we were you know, surfing on the weekends and partying and, and just traveling and seeing Australia. Um, yeah, it was, it was just awesome. Sounds like a badass time for three months. Not bad. Not a bad way to spend your time. Yeah. So um, got <laughs> After- yeah. yeah, so it was like two months, two months in Europe. I I sent them home with my board and my wetsuit and then I backpacked Europe for two months by myself and then got home from that, was home for like Christmas, New Year's and then flew to Australia like first week in February or something and then did three months, February, March, April in Australia. So you've traveled quite a a bit. Yeah. 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 Been all over the place. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. What's one of the greatest? right it's traveling and seeing the world mm-hmm. what's been a, one of your favorite places so far um 
I mean, the surf wise, the, the, the Indo, uh, boat trip, like mm-hmm. going to Indo, living on a boat for 10 days and surfing the best waves in the world with just you and your friends and, um, you know, no Wi-Fi or cell phone for 10 days and just it being, it was that, that like trip is epic. Just next level. Yeah. It's next level. Yeah. Um, I really like, um, Nicaragua a lot. I like, uh, oh, interesting. Like the, okay. the Papuyo zone with just the offshore winds cause of the, uh, lake effect mm-hmm. it's just, just offshore winds like almost all the time. So you don't have to think about if it's going to get choppy and it's, it's got just this great. consistent break. Yeah, there's just great surf there. Yeah. Um, I don't know. There's just everything. Everywhere. Great. <laughs> Love taking road trips to Rhode Island. And, and I know. Maine. We talked about that. Yeah. Yeah. Block Island is like one of my favorite places. Gosh. Yeah. Maine, incredible. Yeah. I'll, it's awesome. You know, Block- yeah, it really is. I mean, any you can go any state in this country that has amazing stuff to go do. It really is. And I always say that, you know, it's like, it doesn't matter what state you live in. There's always going to be cool stuff to do there. You know, it might not be yeah. for, it might not be for me personally, like going to Illinois, I'm not nothing really there for me to do. Cause I love the shoreline, but you know, anywhere like Idaho has always been. And I, I know I say that a lot on the show is like Idaho is one of those unique places that no one hears about, but it's just absolutely gorgeous. You know, there's like a yeah. lot more than just potatoes. Amazing. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. But even like yeah, in states that you don't expect, mm-hmm. um, Oklahoma or Kentucky or, um, you know, Tennessee, like the amount of hiking and rock climbing and rafting and fly mm-hmm. fishing. I mean, it, there's just so much cool stuff to do in states that you don't even think about. Right. Yeah. And you know what? It's kind of, you know, Rhode Island, I feel like falls in that category of like the hidden gem that it's, I feel like some people call it a drive through state, you know, to get through from Connecticut to Boston or you know, up the Eastern corridor, up to like New Hampshire and Maine. But Rhode Island, you know, like you said, is like one of those states that's just really cool. You know, you got these awesome little spots in Block Island, Point Judith, spearfishing, clamming, like, you know, the whole, the jetty life is like Rhode Island. <laughs> oh my God, it really is. I love it up there. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've dove that that um, that break wall off mm-hmm. from the Point Judith uh, ferry. Yep. I mean, insane, like just so much fun. Oh, it's awesome! Now we're, I'm 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 guessing that you were probably on the east wall, like over by the over by the lighthouse diving. We did the we did the center wall. Actually. Oh, really? Yeah, that um, some friends um, actually the dude who who the artist from that oyster that's behind me. Mm-hmm. That's I was gonna I say I like that a lot. Yeah, and the uh, I think it's a striper on the bottom. Um, Dylan, he uh, his family has a, a property right there in Point Judith, like this little island peninsula thing, mm-hmm. and like a boat right from there, right out to that center wall. And he dives it all the time. So he kind of knew the spot and with the tides and whatnot, where to go. And it yeah. was super fun. Yeah, no, it's, I've done quite a bit of spear fishing up in the bay. Um, I can't dive that deep because of my ears are messed up, but like, yeah. you know, 15, 20 feet of water is kind of what you need, you know, for any inshore stuff like tog, black oh, sea bass, totally. stripers. Yeah. You don't have to go that deep, you know? Oh. Absolutely not. I'm, I have issues around 35 on my right ear. And mm. so I'm, I'm in that same like 20 to 30 is my wheelhouse like mm-hmm. all day long. Once I get to that second atmosphere, it's just like it's, <laughs> I, just, I have a really hard time with my right ear. Yeah. I've, had, I've had like nosebleeds. I had 45 once and came up with just like broken oh, blood. No back shit. And like, <laughs> my mask was like filled up with blood. It was just that's I mean, pretty gnarly. <laughs> yeah. I couldn't hear for like two months. You know, it just. Yeah. So I don't even mess with it anymore. And I just, uh, stay in that 20 to 30 foot range for sure. Yeah. Know your, know your, know your boundaries, I think is the big important part there. It's, uh, yeah. it's, it's definitely the key to spear fishing. And it was funny, a friend of mine, we went out one day and, uh, you know, when you get, when you I feel like when you get in the zone a little bit, you know, you see a fish and you want to go right after it and you're, you start to make that kind of like that, that tit for tat, that chase, and I just dove a little too deep, a little too fast, and I I blew my entire left eardrum out completely. And I came that's up. Like, yeah, that's. <laughs> and I, I came nightmare. up. Yeah, it's a nightmare, is what it is, because it puts you out. Like you can't go back down, you know, because you can't equalize, yeah. and it just hurts like you know the dickens. It's crazy. Oh yeah, thing. <laughs> it throws you off too. Like mm-hmm. when you know when that when that ear is just done, like it just it's not working. It, it throws everything off and it, it's, yeah. it's not, 
not a fun injury to have. Uh uh-uh. uh. No, I was I was driving the boat home and I was like, holy shit! Like I don't know where I'm going. <laughs> you know, with all like it felt like I was gonna get seasick. But mm-hmm. you know, there seems to be this theme that's really embedded in Jetty, and that is the Northeast right? Having started in New Jersey. And then it's this culmination of everything that you and your buddies seem to love, whether it's fishing, clamming, um, spear fishing, surfing, you know, seems to be a really big component to it, but it's everything coastal, you know, and, and there's not a lot of brands out there that kind of are specific to the Northeast. So why do you think that is like, why do you think you guys were so gravitated to create something that was, Northeast specific when really, I mean, when you guys put your money in a hat, you could have done anything, you know, you could have, you could have started a, a tackle company or some other apparel brand around skiing. Cause I mean, you guys were going skiing that weekend. So how did you guys come to that decision on, Hey, this is what the plan is. Like, what did that, what did that initial plan look like? Yeah. Um, well, at the time there was, a. 2003, um, you know, it was it was just Quicksilver, Billabong, mm-hmm. O'Neill, Rip Curl, uh, Hurley, not like kinda, because like, mm-hmm. I think they started in 2000, um, and may, they were maybe just starting to get to the East Coast a little bit, um, and then, um, and Volcom, I was just starting to trickle into the East Coast. So there was like a real lack of of brands in, in the surf world and, um, surf versus snow for us, we felt like you needed boots on the ground. That's why we never like, Mm -hmm. we never twisted snow into like our ethos because it just didn't make sense. Cause we couldn't be the closest mountain was two hour drive. And that's to like North Jersey, you know, not even like a great place. Um, so it was like, all right, if we can't regularly be at the mountains doing like promotional events and being like in the community of snow of ski snowboarders, Mm -hmm. then it doesn't make sense for it to be part of the brand's, you know, DNA. Right. Um, but like surf, skate, waterman, whatever, like that stuff we were all partaking in daily. So, and we were, you know, boots on the ground, um, at the, at the coast. Um, so that just made sense as to why that was the kind of the market we chose. Right. Um, but we just saw a void in that market because we knew what we liked. And all we saw was those, like they said, those kind of six brands that were all kind of just doing the same thing at the time. Mm-hmm. Everything kind of looked similar. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. And, and it was like, all right, well, there's a void in this market and, and there's, there's room for something new right. and something East coast. And, um, yeah, we didn't really think about the hurdles of, a brand starting from the East coast. And, and it was a whole different set of things that we had to deal with that the California guys never have had to deal with. Mm. Um, and, uh, yeah, I don't know. We just kind of went in dumb and, and blind and just did it. <laughs> I mean, we barely had like a business plan together. It was just, it was a naive start, um, that we have just pieced together over the years and figured out, but, um, yeah, it was, it was not super strategic at the time for sure. Which, which I think, I mean, I think a lot of people start that way, you know? I mean, ob- like nowadays it's very popular to see these and you can you can tell the brand right away. You know, like you see this brand that pops up out of nowhere, all of a sudden they're, you know, they're like the big wigs, everyone knows them, but you know that they have like a lot of capital investment behind them. They had they wrote they raised, you know, 2 million dollars to to print three t-shirts, meaning, you know, other while you guys just were like, Hey, here's a thousand bucks. Like, let's try and let's try and do this. You know, like there's two different mindsets there, but you know, and, and yeah, and that way is that way is fine. It has its time and place, but I think a good brand, you know, definitely starts with that grassroots kind of feel to it. And to me that, that see, it seems as though that's what Jetty kind of started with. So what were some of the hurdles that you guys had to overcome because you mentioned that in terms of East coast. So I'm really interested because, you know, having this podcast, right. And, and starting it mostly here on the East coast, it's, uh, and, and knowing that there's really not still a, not a lot of East coast brands. What are some of those hurdles that kind of deters companies from coming in and doing something like jetty or just creating an East coast brand in general? 
Well, I mean, the hurdles are kind of broken down now. It's mm. it, um, the playing field has almost fully been leveled mm -hmm. because of social media and the digital age. Um, but at the time, social media didn't exist. The internet was, you know, basically dial up and, right. and there was, there wasn't a power computer in everybody's pocket. And, um, so California didn't need us. The surf industry was based around the magazines and, and the Southern California surf scene. And that, sure. you know, that was it. Um, and if you weren't from Southern California, you weren't like a surf brand or you weren't, you know, um, important for some reason. Right. And, um, so we couldn't get anyone to even give us a look. I mean, I, I, I spent so much time out there um, just going door to door. I mean, a month at a time, I just, mm -hmm. you know, go door to door, dropping off catalogs, introducing myself, and I would do it every year, year after year. Um, each time a new season came out, I was doing the, I would drive from Maine to the Florida Keys and then do wow. um, a couple of weeks in, in California. Um, twice a year, mm -hmm. summer line, fall line. And I would just be dropping catalogs, showing the line to anybody who would give me the chance um, and just doing it myself and growing it little by little. But mm -hmm. California wanted nothing to do with us um, for the longest time. And then once once things just kind of changed, you know, the, the social media just came into the picture and, and mm -hmm. um, digi ads and this whole new digital age we're living in, Magazines started kind of going under, right? And uh, and it just became a non thing that we were from New Jersey, and accounts started. So we still Southern. We're doing great in Northern California. We still have a little bit of a problem in Southern California mm -hmm. with that same mindset um, that they have all these brands in their backyard. Um, so why do they need this Jersey brand? Right. I don't know why. Um, but then the, the people like Hanson's and Encinitas that have adopted us are doing great with it. And mm -hmm. we have a great relationship with them. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's, so you, it's, so you guys were cool. kind of, yeah, no, and, it, and it's really cool to kind of see the differentiate, you know, different brands differentiating themselves in different places of the country and to see how consumers will react to that, you know, and it's going to be different whether you're, you know, there's Florida brands. But a Florida brand isn't going to do as well here in Rhode Island just because, you know, a lot of it has to do with the topography. You know, Rhode Island has rocky shores, you know, so does New Jersey, right? You know, marshes and, you know, seagrass and all these different components to it versus well, another reason, mm -hmm. another reason that that the 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 playing field has weirdly leveled is because of our um, geography and our um our, our harsh changing seasons mm -hmm. that we have in the Northeast, that vibe is almost like what a lot of brands are trying to get. Like <laughs> yeah. they're, they're, you know, like you see like the marketing and the imagery um, of some brands and they'll be like, you know, winter time and it's harsh mm -hmm. conditions and there's a, a hurricane and you know, all this stuff that we live through every year. Right. And they're using it in their marketing and it's like, well, that's just, that's just, a Tuesday for us. That's a day in New England. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, uh, and so I think the authenticism from, you know, from living in it and building the brand from here and being inspired by the commercial fishing villages mm -hmm. and, and the, the baying the scalping, the clamming. Yeah. Um, I think it's just authentic. It's just, it's just our backyard and it's just every day. Um, right. you know, there's not a, um, there's not a, uh, a community, like in California where like there aren't bays, like you don't, you can't just like jump in your, in your skiff and like go dick around in, in the marsh. And you know, it's not a thing, right? It's not a thing. So like, but that lifestyle and vibe is so interesting to everyone right now mm -hmm. that I think that that's a, a, a big part of, of our momentum um, going for sure right now. Yeah. I think that you brought up a really good point there. And, you know, I got to imagine you growing up, that was exactly, you were living that lifestyle, right? Like as a kid, you were growing up, you were going clamming, you were going fishing. So you knew, you know, what it meant to really hop on your skiff and go oystering for the day and then drop a few lines and, you know, get some striper and bring it home and eat. And you're right. That seems to be a very popular thing to do nowadays. And it's very that authentic New England Northeast kind of vibe where, 
you know, in California, they don't have bays. Like when I when I lived out in Hawaii, it was such a different component to driving a boat. You know, as a captain, I'm used to, you know, stay away from the shore. Right. You don't want to get too close because there's probably rocks under you. And meanwhile, in Hawaii, they're like, Zach, why aren't you driving closer? We're supposed to get near the lava rock. And I'm like, what are you talking about? I'm not getting over there. There's massive waves breaking and splashing <laughs> up. And I'm like do you not see that? You know, I'm like, and, uh, so it's, it was just a different mindset, you know, and, and there's, yeah. there's really no bays in Hawaii. There's really no bays in California. I mean, with that being said that you have I, like Catalina Island and, you know, in Washington, the San oh, Juan's yeah. like that exists, but like, there, and there's, yeah, there's not, there's plenty of rad stuff out mm-hmm. there in a lot, I mean, a lot of different facets, but totally. just that one, that one niche of, of the vibe of that, harsh northeast and bayman mm. waterman culture um is our is our every day it's the bread and butter and what i think is really cool about it is that it really generates a strong community right like the northeast i always say you have to earn your good weather like you have to earn those days out on the water you know because a lot of the people up here it's it's working class right it's you're going in every day to to your job whether you're a, a fisherman an oysterman someone that's working on an aquaculture farm or even by the co- coastline like there's so many different hands in you know coastal communities and it's historical like this is where the united states started was in the united in the northeast right so it's kind of ingrained in everyone's ethos so to yeah. have a brand that really reflects that i think it's easy to be authentic you know cuz that this is the northeast like that's exactly what it means to be mm-hmm. um yeah. in that harsh environment you know like it's kind of cool to be able to have to put on your jacket and then go out on the boat and go fishing and kind of feel like a badass <laughs> you know to yeah, some yeah, extent, yeah. right? Yeah, dealing with the the elements um, while you're reeling in like a, a nice striper or something. Yeah, it's yeah, it's rad. You feel like a badass. Yeah, and you know, to to you know, kind of leaning more towards the surfing community. There's no other community of surfers out there that are putting on a six mil and jumping into the icy, freezing cold waters of the of the Atlantic to go catch some waves and then go to work. You know, and that's like the five a.m. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I self admittedly am, am not doing that anymore. You're not doing that anymore. <laughs> I, I used to, I used to in my in you know, t- 15, 20 years ago, but uh, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm a hard pass on that <laughs> right now. I'll, uh, I'll go to Puerto Rico for a weekend and go surf more in three days. Yeah, you know, in warm weather than, uh, than I will in a whole year. Get it out of your. Yeah. 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 Uh, it's brutal. Uh, those guys, I give them a lot of credit. Yeah, it, my my buddy, he's a nut. He'd go out in like snowstorms, and you know I'm all for the the fall, you know, fall surfing, and then early spring. But like winter time, eh, I'm all set. <laughs> I'm not that hardcore. And wetsuit technology is amazing now, and mm-hmm. I really need to give it another shot because the last time, you know, the last couple of times, my wets, you know, just like technology wasn't the same with wetsuits. Mm-hmm. I'm getting flushed. I'm having, you know, ice cream headaches, and I'm just like, oh, what am I doing? This is survival. This isn't fun. Yeah. Um, but now I, I really should give it another shot, but uh, now it's just like whatever. I'm so used right. to just surfing in warm water or, or – or not surfing that, uh, you know, I'll go to the right. mountains and snowboard, you know, I was in Colorado for 10 days. I'll go to Vermont, uh, the next snowstorm. Right. So. Yeah. Well, and that's kind of the other thing about the Northeast that's unique is like you have these seasonal changes in the things that you're doing, right. You know, during the summer, it's a lot of surfing. It's a lot of fishing, but during the winter, you kind of shift towards like this hybrid of depending on who you are, you know, snowboarding, skiing, backcountry camping like and that's kind of the beauty of you know the authenticity of the northeast and it seems as though jetty kind of follows that pattern you know through what you guys create you know you're wearing a flannel right now which by the way is a really cool flannel and i think that you know it's uh yeah no problem it's um but that kind of follows suit with the changing of the season the changing of the times or other companies that's kind of forced right because you're not you you don't have seasons like we know what it's like to have a season. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's a big influence in our product line for sure. So when you guys like were first like kind of rewinding a little bit, you guys first put the money in the hat. You create that those first shirts. Did you go to a company for that? Like what were the what was kind of the 
the bootstrapped, you know, process of creating what is now Jetty? Um, so the first run of shirts we had printed by a local printer here and, um, and he just, there was just no, there was just no imagination to Mm -hmm. what, to what you could do. It was just, it was like black and white, you know, you got to use this Gildan tea. You got, Mm -hmm. you know, heavy, whatever you got to use plastisol ink. You, you, it's either a front, you know, breast print, front center, back center, you know, size tags weren't an option. There was just, it was just limitations. Every turn, it was like, no, it was just, everything was a no. Right. And we were like, well, this is just bullshit. You know, you can print on the hip. Mm -hmm. You can put a size tag in. You can use water-based inks. Like you just are being lazy and you don't want to do it. Um, So one of our partners, his dad taught the graphics design um, and screen printing class in photography and stuff in high school. And I, I had him. I mean, I printed the first screen print I ever did was in one of my partner's um, dad's class. And he, you know, we learned the art of screen printing and all these different things. And um, so he he had just retired and he was he was looking for something to do in his retirement. So he. Mm-hmm decided to buy a four color uh, manual press and start printing t-shirts for the high school. So he had deals with like whatever, the soccer team, the football team, he was printing shirts for mm-hmm. And that happened the same year we had started Jetty. So after the, the no, the second year we started Jetty. So the first year we got printed by this other guy and it just didn't work. So then the second year, Bill's dad was like, hey, I'm gonna buy this stuff and start printing. I'll show you guys, I'll teach you guys how to use it. It's in, it's in the garage. You can just use it for anything you want. Mm -hmm. So he taught us how to screen print. And we, um, so the second year we started doing it ourselves and, uh, we learned about water-based inks and, and all the other options you could do and Mm -hmm. size tags and, you know, printing wherever you want on a sleeve, on a hip, you know, and, um, and that was it. I mean, we four color press in a one car garage, turned into a six color press in a two car garage. And then someone ratted us out of the, the <laughs> town and because we were operating a business out of this garage and then right. like a neighborhood. So after a couple of years, we had to move to our first commercial space and we got like a 1500 square foot warehouse, six color manual. And then we moved to 3000 square feet, got a second six color manual. And then we were there 3,500 square feet for a few years. And mm-hmm. now, and then we moved to where we currently are with a 10 head automatic, an eight head automatic, a six color manual, and like 14,000 square feet, I think. Holy crap. That, yeah. And uh, we're bursting at that seams and we're, we're under contract on a, um, on a building and a dirt lot right now. So like a 4,000 square foot building with like a 1,500 square foot storefront mm-hmm. and then a 25,000 square foot dirt lot that's next to it um, that we can build on as like, hopefully like a, I like this, I'd like to say permanent home, mm-hmm. but I still don't think we're going to be able to build something that's going to be big enough, you know, in five years. Right. It'll be, big, it'll be big enough for the next three years, but I think the growth rate, um, and momentum we have, I think we're going to outgrow that even in a few more years. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. That's incredible. And to, and to see that you guys kind of started from that, you know, in your garage, like so many great brands and companies have started just with, Hey, I got my, my buddies, you know, dad has a screen printer. Let's try and do this thing. And then all of a sudden it starts to grow and grow and grow. Yeah. It's the classic story. Yeah. It's for the sure. classic story. You know, and a good friend of mine, he started a coffee company in his living room. You know, and, yep. you know, in college, what I would do is I'd walk up to his house because he lived right off of campus and we just roast and pack beans until like 1 a.m. in the morning. And then we kept on doing that. And then, you know, I, I was just like his helper. And then all of a sudden I saw him go from a bigger place to a bigger place. Now he's in a 15,000 square foot f- facility shipping beans all around the world. Like it's a really cool to see that kind of process go down and to have a little bit of part of it in that has been awesome. So as you kind of have been growing, you know, you mentioned you have a lot of momentum now, what has kind of driven that momentum and where do you kind of see, um, the, the brand jetty going? Cause you know, having that five-year vision and saying, Hey, you know, I think we're going to be able to grow into and 
you know, or either outgrow, you know, this new facility, but you guys have way more going on than just t-shirts. And, you know, it's been really cool to see, but first, like what, what's been that key driver for the momentum? Do you think? Um, the key driver for the momentum is, is just, we've been around for 18 years and, um, the product is just so good. And, uh, like we're telling a unique story and, um, the, 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 our competitor brands are getting, you know, too big, too corporate to whatever you want to call it. They're, mm-hmm. they're making some missteps. Um, those are all adding up to our momentum. Um, and then the pandemic definitely played in things. We, um, you know, we, we, we launched a rising tide unit initiative to, to raise mm-hmm. money for, um, you know, our, our retailers that were closed. Um, we ended up donating like $90,000 out. Wow. Like you, you could, you know, everybody marketed it for us and you could go to the website, buy the rising tide shirt and then pick the store you wanted to donate your profits to. Oh, that's so, pretty cool. Yeah. So any, so literally it was like just giving 10 bucks every time a shirt was bought, it was like 10 bucks to that store. Um, and then we did it for some bars and restaurants too, that were closed, Mm -hmm. some friends locally. And yeah, we ended up donating like over 90 grand. Um, and when you, you know, when you have 300 retailers across the country and you're like, Hey, here's $500 credit, you know, for your rising tides, here's $3,000 credit, you know, to your account for Mm -hmm. rising tides. People were so pumped. I mean, and we were, we were open and shipping product when a lot of people had their warehouses closed down and weren't shipping and we just, I don't know, we just made some good moves, you know, when, when our retailers couldn't get product from other people or shipping was taking months or, you know, because they were shorthanded, um, whatever the reason. And, um, we just stepped up to the plate and, yeah. uh, yeah, translated to an amazing year last year. And then we're just riding that wave. Yeah. Well, it's kind of cool. Like you mentioned, you know, story is a big component to that. And, you know, Jetty is, has a, you know, you guys have a great story, but at the same time, you're really built on, you know, the whole community aspect as well. You know, it's, it's having this community of retailers and having this community of, of people that, you know, really truly care about those around them, you know, and you guys have started so many other initiatives that, you know, obviously probably have played into the being able to be really be ingrained in your community, you know, not only New Jersey, but across the entire Eastern seaboard and obviously over in California as well. Um, but you know, things like jetty brewing and, and the jetty rock festival. I mean, why is it you guys? Keep- the, yeah. The, that, yeah. that's like, yeah, that's definitely a big part of it too. We, mm-hmm. um, like the nonprofit thing and, and helping others in the community was always just kind of a big part of what we did. Mm-hmm. Um, our first one was, I always forget if it was 2005, 2000, 2005, we, we raised money for hurricane Katrina mm. and donated like five grand or something. That was the first thing we did. And then, uh, like maybe 2006, um, a, a local buddy had uh, testicular cancer a kid we went to high school with and he needed needed help with his hospital bills so we um we threw a, a miniature golf fundraiser because i i worked at a mini golf course when i was a kid uh-huh. and i'm still friends with the owner and um it was called putt for a nut so it was to <laughs> help him raise money for for testicular cancer save the nut uh, putt for a nut and we <laughs> We, we raised like 30 grand between like wow. an auction. Yeah. Like, you know, the community gave stuff for an auction and we had this party at this bar. So all the auction stuff just went off and then everybody came through and played mini golf that day and, and gave money. And, um, and it was like, whoa, we just helped this dude pay off 30 grand of his hospital bills. And he was speechless. Mm-hmm. And, um, it was like, oh, wow, that felt pretty good. Like getting the community together, helping somebody out who fell down. And so then the next year it was like a bartender buddy who had a brain tumor and needed surgery. And we mm-hmm. were like, you know, through a festival called brain games and it was like dunk tank and you know, all these different carnival games and raised another like 20 grand for him. And it was like, yeah. this is pretty cool. Um, and it just started going like that where every year or so it would just be like someone who needed help and mm-hmm. we would just step up and do it. 
And then you fast forward to Hurricane Sandy, where we had built up so much goodwill in the community up until 2012 when Hurricane Sandy happened that when that happened, literally everyone just like pivoted, looked at us and we're like, what are we doing to help? What's what's next? <laughs> yeah, like what what are you guys doing? Like we're here to help. Yeah. And it was like, oh, okay, well now like I guess this is on us like to figure something out. Right. So we we did a, a t-shirt and raised like a half million dollars. Like it was like wow. stupid. And or we donated half a million. Mm -hmm. We got people back into their homes, got businesses reopened. Like you know, we turned into a nonprofit operation for three months, I think. I mean, mm -hmm. all we were printing was that Hurricane Sandy Relief t-shirt and we were gutting sheetrock out of, out of houses. We had teams organized in parking lots. Like, all right, you guys go to this section of houses. We had lists of, you know, we had leaders in each community mm -hmm. and that had lists of the houses that needed to be gutted. It was like wild. And, um, that made us form our nonprofit because we quickly realized that we couldn't filter half a million dollars out without like the IRS getting super pissed off. Right. So we are like, all right, I guess we got to form a nonprofit to filter that money out to the community. And then from that point on, it's just been, you know, every February we would throw a, um, a fundraiser for locals in need, um, you know, cancer uh, issues that people were dealing with. Mm -hmm. um, every June, we'd throw our, our hop sauce uh, craft beer and hot sauce festival um, that just raised general funds for our nonprofit to go out to different things. Um, then August, we have the Coquina Jam, which is f uh, a women's surf contest for uh, to raise money for for um, a local cancer foundation called David's Dream and Believe. Every October, there's a crab cake, you know, dinner. It yeah. just became like, all right, like our what, helping the community and being part of the community is just part of Jetty. It, that just is what it is, you know? Right. Um, and that's been just a huge part of, of our growth and, and community support, especially. It's insane. Yeah. Um, but but you know what? Like, passed, yeah. We just surpassed 1.5 million in um, donations. Holy crap. That's incredible. Yeah. You know, the cool various, various stuff, hurricane relief, can you know, uh, health and wellness, cancer stuff, uh, environmental, the oyster shell recycling program. We get oysters back out into the bay to regenerate natural reef. Uh, mm -hmm. we, all this stuff. In total, the donations have surpassed 1.5. Wow, that's incredible. And the cool thing about it is, you know, you see a lot of companies out there that'll just they'll donate, you know, some money and they'll be like, "All right, here you go. Like we donated. Yay." Oh. Which yeah, that's great. Like nice. But yeah. you guys are literally out there like spraying oyster shells off these barges. You guys are in in the homes tearing down drywall and removing insulation and you know building houses and and really doing these uh, community events but being authentic to you know you. Like you Corey, you know, like truly caring about these people and the friends and family that have kind of help Jetty grow and then giving back. And it's just like this really cool cycle. And, you know, you brought up your oyster shell recycling program and because the environment is such a, you know, important component to Jetty, but to everyone, right. Being on the coastline, it, that's a perfect example of how the cycle continues, right? You guys yeah. taking the opportunity to take oyster shells, put them back in, create these reefs and then fuel an ecosystem that we can then go and enjoy. Right. So, yeah. One of the great things I, I I think you guys are doing right now is being innovative, not only on the front of your community, but also with the the fact that you are creating different types of garments and um, you know fabrics with. I, I'm going to pronounce it wrong. Oystex. Did I say that right? Yeah. All right, Oystex. Oystex. Yeah. So yeah. that that's incredible. What what was kind of the um the driver behind that? Like most people are gonna be like, yeah, we print t-shirts We're we, you know, we, we create stuff. And then you guys are like, no, we're, we're going to change the way apparel is done, you know, at its core. Yeah. I mean, I, we can't take credit for inventing the, the fabric. Mm -hmm. um, we aren't at a scale yet where we can develop something like that. Um, it, it, we just, we found, we learned that it existed, that, that, mm -hmm. uh, this company, um, in Taiwan had, had developed a, um, a fiber thread that, that was recycled plastic bottles and, um, and pulverized oyster shell, the calcium hmm. carbonate, um, 
so they would uh, poly, you know, it's plastic, it's extruded, um, and they would, you know, drop the pulverized oyster shell in there as a powder, and it would add like a, a toothiness, like a fiberness hmm. to the um, to the thread, which acted as a really good insulator, um, and it, you know, had had other uh, properties that the that the calcium carbonate um, adds, um, anti-static, anti-odor, um, some really cool things like that, and so. We had been looking for a way to improve our product line and to incorporate some new fabrics and things that, mm -hmm. that, that we really um, loved. And, and when we learned about the, the um, oyster shell stuff, it just it was a no brainer because we'd been doing the oyster shell recycling program for four years at that point, I guess. Right. And it just connected the dots. It was just like, oh, well, this is obvious. Like mm -hmm. we can now get this thread, use it. So that, you know this this thread exists, and then we combine it with all types of other fabrics and type and types of uh, uh, sewing and knitting processes to create the garments. So you know there we're 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 building the product out of it, but it already existed before we uh, we came on board. Right. <laughs> yeah, you know I can't we can't take credit for that. No, but you are building the initiative behind it, you know, and and being able to yeah. market this to like, hey, there's other ways to produce sustainably, pr um, you know, sustainable products, right? Like we're giving back yeah. to the community and we're not just, it's not just a take, right? It's this balance of, you know, give and well, take. Well, the most important part of it is is the education part of it. Mm. And and um, like when people, when we talk about the fabric, you're talking, you then talk about just oysters in general, uh, the recycling program and how important oysters are to our environment. I mm -hmm. mean, people don't realize that, you know, that they're the lung of our waterways and that they literally, their job is to filter the waters and 90% of our world's natural oyster reefs are gone. Right. Like because of, you know, overpopulation and, um, you know, runoff has killed them or, um, over farming. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you, if, if you get an oyster in a restaurant now it's farmed, I mean, right. there's not like, People aren't getting, you're not finding natural oyster reefs somewhere. Like back, whatever, a hundred years ago, like New York City or, or, or the you know, the bays along the Jersey Shore, yeah. like you could just go out and pull oysters up, but that's not a thing. Um, but meanwhile, an oyster can filter up to 50 gallons of water in one day. And they just literally just are cleaning our water the whole time. Yep. So the fact that 90% are gone is like, Oh, well, obviously that's not okay. Like right. what can we do to fix that? All right. Well, we can collect oyster shell, get it to Mariculture center, get baby oyster set on it, get it back out to, you know, a research lease that can't be farmed and we can help this process, um, you know, protect the, the coastlines from erosion, build a uh, habitat for sea life. Uh, you know, all these positives mm -hmm. that come out of it. Um, yeah, it was just like, again, it's just an authentic thing that makes sense to us. Right. Helping people, helping the environment. Like, these are just like, <laughs> yeah, obviously, obviously. Like, why right. Would, why wouldn't you do this stuff? Yeah. You know? Yeah. But it, it, it does seem like it should be common sense, but for a lot of people, it's not right. And it's, and it's not because it's not that because they don't want to, it's just the lack of education around it you know and i think you know having a brand to kind of support and bolster that is super important it's like you it's 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 really critical for brands and and people to connect on these issues of sustainability and you know friends with cancer and, and trying to connect this community together and i think jetty does a really nice job of that and it all kind of comes back to the whole vote with your wallet thing right like voting for you know buying shirts from jetty you know, something that's oyster tax that supports, you know, this sustainable outlook and mindset and this helping mentality versus just taking, you know, I think that's a super important thing to do. And people are starting to catch on. I really do. I really think so. And, and, it, and it shows because you guys are obviously growing like crazy. So it's, um, it's really refreshing to see companies like Jetty going out there and doing it. But then also, you know, <laughs> now, you know, you guys are sitting around like, you know, rewind a little bit. You guys are sitting around drinking beer with twenty, you know, two hundred bucks in a hat. And you're like, no shit, we're gonna we're gonna start our own beer company, <laughs> Jetty Brewing. Yeah, that <laughs> uh, jeez, I forget what even year 
it started. It started as just like kind of a marketing thing um, to ma- to raise money for the nonprofit. Actually, mm-hmm. it was uh, uh, we private labeled a beer with a, a company in Jersey, sold it at a couple of restaurants, and it like immediately was like the number two seller. And it was just <laughs> it was just made as like um, I think it was like a fifty cent kickback from every pint sold went to the nonprofit. Mm-hmm. But at the end of the season, we were like the number two beer at this, at these couple of bars. Um, and we were like, Whoa, okay. That's, those are legit numbers. Right. And then uh, second year, same thing. Number two behind like Yingling or something. And um, so then at, at that point we were like, okay, there's a business here and it makes sense because what are you doing you know, at the end, if you, you, you hike a bowl to go to go ride, mm-hmm. you have a beer in your bag that you're cracking at the top. Right. What are you doing at the end of like a long session, uh, traveling somewhere or whatever? You're cracking a beer. Uh, what are you doing on the boat after, you, you know, when you're on your way back in to the dock, mm-hmm. you're cracking a beer. You know, like the having the beer just made sense to the story of the brand. Right. Um, so... We teamed up with a local brewery, and we uh, we have a second flavor on the market now, and we're gonna probably have a third by the end of the year. That's awesome. So is that like really is is that part of Jetty? I mean, I'm, I'm assuming you guys kind of separate things a little bit, but is this something like you gotta kind of hand it's that, that off? It's a separate LLC. It's yeah. a separate LLC for like for insurance and purposes and whatnot. Right. Um, separate business, same partners. Um, but yeah, it's uh, but yeah. it's great. I mean, it's you know, it's not it's by no means like a a very lucrative thing. It's just like more of a passion project. It just we enjoy it. We like having you know our couple beers that we can mm-hmm. you know bring out on the boat, and it's ours. And it's we develop the flavors that we want to have. Mm-hmm. Um, and it distribution is just in New Jersey. We're um, you know along the coastline for even the most part. Not even like all of new jersey right so it's pretty limited but we gotta get that stuff out to block island i mean i bring some with me but i uh i know i need we need distribution all over the coast because at this point you know like the coastline knows the brand right right coastal communities surf shops bars it's all kind of you know intermingled Mm -hmm. so we'd have success at any of these coastal communities that we were able to sell into um building the brand first, how we have the marketing vehicle, the beer comes behind it. It's, Mm -hmm. it's different. It's the opposite from what most beer companies do where, you know, they create the beer and then they start selling it and then they have to build the name up. Right. Name's already there. We just need to get the distribution in place. Um, you know, for it to make sense. Exactly. uh, Yeah. Yeah. It's just a fun, kind of side passion project little, little project i love it i love how you guys have these little things going on and, and you're just constantly thinking of new ways to kind of get the name out and you know it at first i was like oh it's like the jetty ecosystem but then you guys are more like no it's the jetty life like it's the lifestyle of everything jetty which i think so beautifully kind of intertwines and intermingles everything into like this one ethos of like hey this is what we're about we're about the coastline which is awesome so yeah. We have a full our screen printing our screen printing division too. Jetty Inc. That's right, Jetty we, Inc. Yeah, we print. It's it's you know the Jetty brand, and then underneath that is Jetty Rock Foundation, Jetty Brewing Company, Jetty Inc. Mm-hmm. Um, and the Inc. division prints shirts for you know Joe the mechanic down the road for twenty shirts um, to what last year I mean, we've done a bunch of jobs for Red Bull and hmm. uh, the Baltimore Orioles. We printed shirts really? for yeah. <laughs> Years ago, we printed shirts for Manny Pacquiao for a fight that he was. It was like, yeah, we print shirts for anybody that wants them. Um, we specialize in like water-based inks and like high-quality shirts. Right, right, yeah. yeah. So you, you know, water-based inks seem to be a kind of a theme. Is that just because sustainable, non-toxic, that that sort of thing? Is that the mindset yeah. behind it? Yeah. 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 That's- well, that and we really like the hand on it. At the end of the day. Um, mm-hmm. Plastisols are, are improving a lot, and there's some benefits to them as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but water base cleans up with water; it doesn't clean up with chemicals. Right. Um, and then at the end of the day, it's got a really soft hand where you don't even feel it, you know, on mm-hmm. the shirt. Which that's 
the end result is what is really appealing to us for the plastisol inks. Yeah. Um, but yeah, ink, I mean, there's new inks that are made out of algae. Um, there's all types of crazy stuff out there now. <laughs> well, it's been kind of cool to hear the story behind like how you guys were, you know, you kind of came in towards the end of, you know, or I should say the beginning of this era where, you know, surf culture and fishing and everything was kind of coming together. And you, you kind of took that vibe and that, that community and just built what is now Jetty. So through that entire process, did you guys come across like any big challenges, big hurdles that kind of stick in your mind? And, you know, maybe a point where you're like, all right, we're waving the white flag here. Like, you know, Jetty's cool, but you know, we got to keep moving on. Or was it always, you know, this is something that we're really passionate about. Like no matter what, you know, through thick and thin, we're going to be making shirts. Um, no, I mean, there was, so like three of the original five partners aren't involved anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, our CEO, Jeremy and myself are the two founders that, that are still involved. Um, the three guys left, um, not for any negative reasons. We're all still friends. Um, one of, one of the guys came back and now runs our screen printing ink operation. Oh, cool. Um, yeah. It, it, like, um, it, one of our really good friends, but, um, the guys left, you know, they, uh, one dude was, you know, uh, had a, a kid on the way, mortgage, wife, you know, it, it, it's just like he had to stop hemorrhaging money, you know, because right. it was, we were, we were taking turns maxing our credit cards out, you know, at that <laughs> point. It was, all right, dude, it's your turn. Like, you got to put up five grand, you know, all right, you know, fuck, okay. And we, I was just, we were working bartending shifts and yeah. making cash um, and just, putting it into the business, uh, for a while. And three of the guys just, just left because they just couldn't do it anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, families, wives, kids, houses, um, things like that. As we got into our, you know, late twenties, early thirties. Um, and then, uh, me and Jeremy kept going and we kept looking at each other and all right, dude, you know, you're going to match your credit card out again. And, and, you know, we were kind of just talking each other off the ledge. Yeah. I was the one that was out there seeing the response of people in the stores, seeing the trade shows, seeing the response of, you know, uh, the fans or the retailers. And, and I just kept going, Oh man, we can do this. Like, I just, I get, we got, we got something, something here. Yeah. Yeah. Like I know, I just feel it. I feel like we can do this. And he just kept, all right, if you're in, I'm in. And I'm just <laughs> like, all right, like I'm, I'm in. And then, um, we brought into, uh, like in board level and kind of investing, uh, partners, um, to buy out that last guy to mm -hmm. buy all the screen printing. And this is a little bit more information, but the last dude who bailed, he owned all the screen printing equipment. So mm -hmm. we needed, uh, we needed capital that we didn't have because we were bartending on the side and putting everything in the business, um, to buy all the equipment from them. So we brought in some, um, investors to give us that capital. And then from there, the one investor's son happened to be, freaking insane graphic designer. So then he came on board um, and he's now our, our chief creative officer. Uh, oh, creative cool. Director. Yeah. And so we have five partners again, but it's a different five. It's a different. Only two of us are, are the original. Um, but yeah, we did, dude. It was max out your credit cards, <laughs> walk, talk each other off the ledge, like just convincing that we can, we can do this. Right. And, um, and yeah, eventually two, this is my second year. No, I'm going into my third summer that I haven't bartended a shift. So yeah, the first 16 years of jetty, I was bartending nights to, to pay my personal bills. Mm -hmm. And then the last two, I finally stopped bartending. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned that, you know, when we, when we had a, a brief phone call earlier in the week is, you know, I kind of asked the question of, well, how long you been, you know, has this been like a full-time thing for you for a while? And you're like, no, this has only been, you know, two or three years. And I'm like, really? How long has Jetty been around? 18. I'm like, holy crap. Like that is some, I mean, it was full time. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 It was full time. Was full time. It was the whole time, but over time, <laughs> then I'd go for, you know, four o'clock to two in the morning, right. Three nights a week or four nights a week. I mean, I would go up to Hoboken to bartend, go to Atlantic city. I'd go out to Philly. I mean, I was working, I was working, I worked for James Beard chefs to mm -hmm. like, little dive bars to big nightclubs. I've done the gamut of, of <laughs> bar work. 
<laughs> that's um, awesome. <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's it kept us going. It's a testament to the grind, you know, like trying to really just if you if you believe in something, if you believe in yourself and the people around you, then you gotta you gotta put up or shut up because that's what it takes, you know. It takes the long hours and early mornings and late nights. So, um, well, very cool. Well, where can a little bit, a little bit of insanity, a little bit of stupidity, and just keep going. And sing, single, no kids helps a lot. <laughs> that, that, yeah. that helps a lot. Yeah, I can imagine. I can, I can definitely imagine that. So, you know, as as Jetty continues to evolve, you know, and and you guys continue to push forward, where is like, where do you kind of see the scope of this going? You know, you guys have your hands in so many different things, but it all kind of revolves around this like coastal lifestyle. But where does it stop? You know, like, where do you or or how do you keep going? How do you keep innovating and keep thinking for that next thing? Um, it's tough. I mean, we're, we're you know, we're designing, we just finished designing and um, summer 22 and getting mm -hmm. all the samples in production. Um, and fall 22 is, you know, next up. That's got to be done in the next um, couple months. Uh, and and that it's it's a, it's on creatives plate really at this point. Um, you know, we have a really good creative team, and uh, you know, it's only a few guys, but mm -hmm. uh, we're actually hiring right now as well for a women specific designer. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it's tough to forecast and then. And look at that magic eight ball and predict what's going to happen in certain terms of trend and product. Um, we're just really focused on what we like and what we want, and, mm. you know. And, and um, I give a lot of input into that because I'm out there in the stores and, and at the shows and talking to a lot of people. And um, where we expand into categories um, is a lot of input that I throw out there. Uh, but Brand product wise, we're just going to keep on staying the course and moving forward, introducing um, a couple new things here and there. Keep expanding on that Oystex uh, mm -hmm. fabrics a lot. We have um, for fall, we have sweaters coming out with that, um, jacket coming out with that, um, some really cool stuff. I mean, still have flannels and 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 some beanies with it and stuff. Sure, but we're expanding the Oystex selection. Um, and then brand we. We have some key hires to make right now, and and we're really uh, we have a three year and a five year plan um, that involves that that property developing a building, all those types of steps. Um, the growth rate is is definitely pretty pretty heavy but attainable, mm -hmm. and uh, we just keep staying the course. We just got our heads down. Our heads are in the trenches. Um, it's you know I I manage uh, a dozen reps around the country, but I handle New Jersey, Maryland, and Delaware myself mm -hmm. with a, an in-house um, guy. Um, you know, so my head's in the trenches with those guys. So when I'm talking to them as a sales manager, I'm talking to them as one of them. Right. You know, hey, this is a this is a, a change we're making. This is something we're doing. Here's a, a sales asset for you. But I'm building it from my side because I want it to use it for yeah. my account. Um, so. It, we don't do a great job with stepping outside the business, which we need to do a better job of that and really having a concise vision for the steps. Mm -hmm. um, but we get caught up in that day to day that we are so entrenched in um, and just making the right decisions day after day to keep steering the ship in the right direction. Right. That's pretty much just what we do. Yeah. Uh, knowing that we need to be looking at a, a 30,000 you know, foot view. Sure. Sure. But it's like that balance, right? Like you, you have all these ideas and everything that you need to get done, but at the same time, it's like, all right, well, let's print a shirt, you know, like, let's do this. Let's go take it by step by step, molecule by molecule, like the little steps equal the big one. So, but, um, you know, Corey, it's been a real pleasure being able to chat with you today and learn all about Jetty and the story behind it. And, how you guys are so integral into the community, you know, on, along the coastline, especially here on the East coast. So I uh, just want to thank you. And uh, yeah, well, well, before that, actually, I, where can, um, it was fun. yeah, yeah, it was a lot of fun, but where can people find out more about Jetty? Um, at the Jetty life mm -hmm. um, would be the, uh, the Facebook and Instagram um, jettylife.com, the website, uh, 
yeah, I mean, those are the two main sources for sure. Social media and, and the, the interwebs. Interwebs. Um, yeah. And cool. uh, yeah, I'm Corey underscore Higgins uh, Instagram. I've, ne- I've never been on Facebook. But, <laughs> and C-O-R-Y, there's no E in, in Corey for me. Yeah, right, 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 right. Cool. Awesome. Yeah, that's, that's, where, that's where you can keep up to date on all the things we're doing. Awesome. Well, thank you, Corey. Yeah, appreciate your time and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Yeah, pleasure, man. That was fun. Yeah.